Good morning. And I'm very happy to be here today to tell you about geoarchaeology, which is uh, my own specialism. First of all, I wanted to ask you, challenge you about what your concept of an artifact is. Most of us conceive of an artifact that can be defined as an object that's been made, modified, or used by humans. We all think we know what an artifact is. But actually, soils and sediments can also be made and modified by humans. And archaeologists are increasingly viewing these as artifacts that need to be studied in their own right. So when you're on an excavation, all of the spoil that gets moved off of the site, it's called spoil. In North America, it's called the back dirt pile. It's the waste product from the site. But in fact, that's full of really valuable information about the activities taking place on the site as well. And I think it needs to be studied. So that's what geoarchaeology is all about. It's the application of earth sciences, uh, their concepts, the techniques, to the understanding of soils and sediments on archaeological sites and the landscapes around archaeological sites. It helps us look at ancient environments, human environment relations, land use, and so on. There are several different disciplines that feed into the study of geoarchaeology. Uh, geology, to start with, the study of rocks and minerals. Geomorphology, the study of landforms. Uh, sedimentology, so that's the study obviously of sediments, that's any material that's been transported and most of those layers that you're excavating on an archaeological site are sediments of one kind or another. And pedology, the study of soils, because of course once a site has been uh, excavated and, um, uh, and when it was occupied and then abandoned, what's left behind becomes part of the soil um, and soil formation processes occur on that site. Um, just like everywhere else in the landscape. So we need to understand pedology as well. So there's different scales at which geoarchaeology can be applied on site. Um, and we'll be first looking at the scale of the site itself before we look at the wider landscape scale. So on site, geoarchaeology is helping archaeologists understand what's called site formation processes. That is, all of the processes involved with the deposition of sediments, how they move around and how they might change. Preservation conditions. We need to understand why bones may be preserved on some sites and not others, why certain kinds of artifacts are preserved on some <coughs> sites and not others. And the geoarchaeological methods can help us understand that. Site stratigraphy. So that is understanding uh, the layering on the site, how each one, each particular layer uh, is composed uh, and where that material might come from. And finally, the thing that really interests me is the location of activity areas on a site. So looking at different residues of human activity uh, on the site to see what people were doing where. Different ways that we can sample uh, to look at sediments on a site. We can look at sediments on a grid, for example, a half meter grid or a 50 uh, or, or a one meter grid. Um, sample really systematically and analyze all of the sediments in the same way using techniques I'll tell you about in a minute. And that allows us to look at spatial patterns uh, in these sediments. And you can also take undisturbed sediments, not in a bag, but in a little tin, allows you to look at um, the sediments undisturbed. From this tin, we manufacture thin sections, little glass slides like this, that have intact pieces of stratigraphy that we can analyze on a petrographic microscope. So if you're sampling on a grid on a site, you can then uh, lay out your data using a mapping program such as a GIS. And this is the sort of information that we can get. What I'm displaying here is electrical conductivity, which gives you, it's a very simple test um, that gives you uh, an indication of the soluble salt content. Um, this is being displayed on uh, the, the plan of a Viking Age house, uh, this one based in, in Iceland. Um, but we have lots of them here in Scotland as well. And as you can see, the patterns are different in different parts of the house. And there's one particular corner that has really, really high soluble salt content that's probably related to either seaweed salt being deposited or urine. Other techniques that we use, pH, that is the one that gives us information about the preservation conditions because things like bone, for example, will completely disappear if the pH is very low very, on very acidic environments. Magnetic susceptibility is a technique that allows us to test the magnetic properties of a soil or sediment. That tells us 
whether it's been heated or burnt, for example, it can tell us where the hearths are if they're not as clear as this one here that has a curb lining to it. Organic matter content can tell us more about the composition of these sediments. We can analyze individual elements or lots of elements together, a technique that's called multi-element analysis. So that gives us more of an indication of what those sediments are composed of. And then soil micromorphology, which is the study of those thin sections I told you about a minute ago. So just as an example, this is how an archaeologist might excavate a house that has lots of different floor layers in it. And all of these red squares are the micromorphology samples. And when you look at them in thin section, you can see things like this. This is actually compacted grasses. Just north of the hearth, there were some um, also little indications that there was grass uh, phytolith, these little silica bodies that are deposited in grass and dung. So we can see that there are some crumbs of herbivore dung just north of the hearth. Uh, Herbivore dung was also accumulating on this end of the house, where there's probably some animal stalls. And finally, on this side of the house, in an area that was probably covered by a platform, there were indications of bones, burnt bones, organic material that had not been trampled. And you can see that this was um, probably covered and protected, therefore. So using all that kind of information, we can reconstruct activity areas on a farm like that, okay, on a farmstead, and look at uh, interpreting how different spaces were used. And finally, at the landscape scale, geoarchaeology is contributing to information about where sites were located in the landscape, what those past environments were like, whether they were forested, whether they were grasslands, how people were using them, where their fields were, what their land use practices were, and different kinds of impacts that human activities, such as mining or metalworking, for example, has on the environment. And just to give you an example of an environment close to home, this is Orkney on the island of Westray, where James Barrett was working on the site of Coigru. And there, a landscape study was done around that Viking Age and medieval site, test pitting, for example. And then all of these little um, dots you can see on this map are the results of an intensive auger survey where you take small cores uh, of the soils and look at them without having to dig lots and lots of test pits. And what you can see here uh, are the different depths of the soil that were a result of that auger survey. And the final result there was that there was a, a deep soil here, a field, <laughs> yay, <laughs> a field that was developed um, in the 13th and 14th century artificially thickened. So that's the kind of information that you can get uh, from these auger surveys. So if you're interested in geoarchaeology, I look forward to talking to you later. And also wanted to let you know that there's uh, an online resource, English Heritage has um, science advisors and it also pu publishes um, kind of science advice online. And this is a really helpful guide to anybody uh, who's interested in learning more about these methods, what kinds of things you can do on a site, and who to talk to if you want more information about that. Okay, thank you.